Yes. So it's my yes, yes, yes. It's my great pleasure to now start the fifth of our seminars. Some almost a year ago, I applied to the a funding body, Inspiring Australia, for funds to put on uh, five seminars. And the seminars were aimed at the odysseys of scientists and others interested in science and how they get to where they, they are now. And so I had five seminars planned. And we are at the fifth seminar now, the last one, where we've got... Uh, Gary Allen and Matt Haywood speaking to us. In terms of the audience, I wanted you to think about what it means to be a mentor. I wanted you to think about uh, who are your mentors, and I wanted you to transmit to any young person that you may come into contact with that the scientists and those in science are real people who enjoy what they're doing and therefore a career in STEM is a, a good career, a fun career as well as a career that is good for the nation. The organisation running these five seminars is called the Hunter Innovation and Science Hub. Incorporated, it is a group of us in Newcastle, some 30 member organizations, all involved in um, taking science to the community. And if you have a look at the Hunter Innovation and Science Hub web, uh, website, you'll be able to also see the recordings from the last four uh, seminars that we've put on. So the question uh, for those who uh, watching is uh, about who is your mentor. That didn't work, Gary. We'll try that one. That didn't work, Gary. Oh, that's stupid. We'll try that. That worked. So what I wanted to do was to start off with the most important person for me, and that's me. I'm my most important person. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that that person, Tim Roberts, because I had a journey in science as well, and I had a mentor, and I see my mother as my mentor because when my brother Michael and I were growing up, uh, we moved from farm to farm because my father worked as a farm laborer, mum didn't work, and uh, we just moved from farms to farms according to how the economy went and also how the farmer's sons grew up. And so uh, mum said, look, you don't want to be a poor farm labourer all your life. You should go to university. And at that stage, uh, none of her generation really knew what the university was. But um, Michael, my brother and I, we did uh, troop off to university in various ways. Uh, with assistance from uh, scholarships and so on. So I went to the University of Adelaide and was there until uh, the end of 67. Then I did a PhD at Flinders because I found that science was really, really interesting and I didn't want to be a school teacher. I thought, well, I'll keep on doing this science thing. And I started a PhD. My PhD was going to be how to control the population of the world by creating a contraceptive vaccine. And we're all into vaccines now. We all know about vaccines. We know about T cells. We know about B cells. We know about antibodies. And so what one needs to do to make a vaccine is find an antigen uh, that can be used in the vaccine that is absolutely specific to sperm. And the difficulty is in finding that antigen because you don't want to generate antibodies that cross-react with brain cells or other parts of the body because that would be a problem. And so I worked away at that and then I published a paper. A fellow in Belgium criticised my paper. So I wrote back to him. Everything was done by typewriters and uh, by, by uh, letter. I wrote back to him and said, um, 
Thank you very much for your comments and felt very upset about what he said about my paper. But I said, uh, you don't perchance chance have uh, any money for a postdoctoral scholarship for me. And he wrote back and said, we'd love to have you in the laboratory in Belgium. Um, you'll have to learn to speak French if you want to be able to buy any food. Other than that, most of the lab work is done in English. So off I went and had two wonderful years in Brussels uh, and in Europe. And then another scholarship came up to go to Cambridge. So I had a year in Cambridge. And after that, wanted to come home, came home to Newcastle. And I started as a lecturer. And I really have never had a proper job since because I've been at the University of Newcastle forever and ever. And I'm currently still occupying an office one day a week at the University of Newcastle as an emeritus professor in biology. Along the way, uh, I decided that it'd be really nice to build a hands-on science center in Newcastle. So I built the second uh, hands-on science center after Questacon in Canberra. Our supernova was uh, started in 1982 and it's still running now after whatever that is, uh, 40 years almost, uh, here in Newcastle as a major part of the Newcastle Museum. In 2006, I was asked to go to Singapore and set up the university's campus in Singapore. So off I trundled and had three wonderful years in Singapore, setting up the campus up there. Came back, uh, retiring actually uh, in 2009, but then uh, the university asked if I'd take over running of it. Institute for the Environment. So I did that and we started with Gary Ellum the Hunter Valley Electric Vehicle Festival that's still running and will be running next year as well. Uh, we started the Hunter Innovation and Science Hub. And then in 2018, uh, we had patented some work from our laboratory. So we set up a company and I'm now trying to sell a wonderful product uh, on the internet. My internet connection's unstable, it said. That frightened me. But um, uh, so, so that's me. And I put all of that down to mum saying, look, you've got to do the subjects at school so that you'll get a, the right path to take you into university. And really had no idea what university was. Uh, at that stage, it was just something that happened in the city. And um, that's the way I went. But I am really, really grateful that indeed uh, that happened. You might be able to see down the right hand side of your screen and I can't uh, unless I get rid of that. Yes, I can. Um, I've had the wonderful pleasure of taking students to Indonesian Borneo in 2018, 2019 to work with uh, partner universities in uh, Indonesian Kalimantan. Uh, and we've done great things with the proboscis monkey as well as the orangutan. And those uh, trips are still ongoing. As soon as COVID gets out of the way and the borders open, I'll be taking another trip to Borneo. I have research projects in Borneo, research projects in Kenya. And in 2020, I took uh, a group of 10 students to Kenya for two weeks. And that cultural immersion in Kenya has resulted in me now uh, sponsoring a Maasai lady, girl, about 24 years old, who never finished school. And uh, we've just helped her set up a, a chicken farm. And so and she's just starting to get the chickens to lay eggs. And we hope that that's going to be a way for her to climb out of poverty. So that's happening. And I am delighted with the results. Let me go to the next slide. So Kiara Harrison has other things to do tonight. So I'm the Lone Ranger and host. We have two speakers, Gary Ellum and Matt Haywood. And I would 
suggest that if you have your phone with you, you might like to take a photograph in case you want to ask Gary or Matt a question later on, you can just photograph their email addresses. So it's my great pleasure now to introduce Gary Ellum, who I've known since uh, a long, long time. Um, and he's a most wonderful person. He says that he's a scientist. I know that. He's an analyst and an entrepreneur. And he is all those things. Gary's done a PhD on limpets. There's some limpets there on the right. And he's lectured. Uh, interestingly, he's also taken out patents in the fields of wireless signal communication, thermal processing of biomass, and microalgae photobioreactor design. So he's a man of many, many talents. And I would like now for you all to clap your hands together to introduce Gary Ellum to the stage. I can't hear you, Gary. Why can't I hear you? How about now? There you go. Yes, uh, I can hear you microphone. now. Fantastic. Okay, wonderful. Um, thanks for the introduction, Tim. And I must say that, yes, Tim and I have known each other for far too long now. Um, and Tim was actually an important step on my journey. Um, so I can remember turning up to my first biology lecture as an undergrad uh, and having this amazing um, overly energetic lecturer come bounding on and, and throw the world at us and then invite us to say if you're interested you, you should come and work in my lab and so I went okay so I went and volunteered to work in his lab as an undergrad I was qualified to do pretty much nothing other than load pipettes into um, into canisters and things but apparently that was useful but it did let me hang around the lab and talk to people and that was um, a really good insight straight away from an undergrad student to actually see what happens in a research lab right from the beginning and realize these things you know these people are just people they're doing stuff which is kind of interesting um, and there's a whole world to get into there so that was a really big step for me um, straight away to realize that um, if you're interested in something, you just need to get into it. You can't sort of just step back and say, well, I'll just do my course and tick the boxes. That doesn't get you anywhere. You actually got to sort of get up and get in and show that you're interested in life. And if you do that, other people get interested in you and life is much easier after that. Um, so what I'll do is do a little bit of a screen share here because that's what we have to do these days. Um, and so what I'm going to do is to attempt to map out a bit of a journey um, where I've come from, which is basically from a um, what I call a trans toad researcher, that'll become clear later on, um, all the way in, uh, to becoming a tech company executive. And then after that, I'll show you what I'm interested in doing next, because of course, everything is just a stepping stone to something else. I've um, got to say, as, as a young guy um, growing up in high school, I was pretty much interested in everything, um, like year 11 and 12, just chose you know all the subjects you could didn't choose biology, which was interesting. So I actually did like, you know, four unit maths, physics, chemistry, engineering, science, English, and PE of all things. Um, that was kind of fun. I was in the school basketball team, I was in the school band, um, you know, in the school madrigal group. So we used to sing like, you know, 14th century choir stuff, which was kind of fun. You know, so doing lots of stuff, whatever you could be interested in get into as far as I was concerned. Um, and then, so coming out of um, school, I had really no idea of, what I wanted to do, to be honest. I um, just wanted to still do everything. So uh, it turned out the university had a combined degree, so you could do maths and science together. Uh, and I thought, well, that's good. Uh, I could do four majors then. I don't have to choose any of them. So, so I majored in maths, physics, chemistry, and biology, just to do a bit of everything. Um, and then got through to the end of it all and decided that even though I hadn't done biology until university, I actually really quite enjoyed biology. But I thought what made me a good biologist was actually that I was a physicist. So I ended up deciding to be um, a biophysicist after that. Um, but in my honours project, um, I started to get interested more in ecology. Um, and so uh, Tim was talking about how he started off with his PhD looking at a virus to try and uh, control population. Well, at that point, um, and still is, you know, cane toads are obviously running rife across northern Queensland and, and coming, you know, across in WA and, and down the coast here as well. And we were interested in um, ideas of how you might use viruses to control, to create sterile males. And hopefully if you could make all the male population sterile, there's a chance you could actually, you know, reduce the population size. Um, but to do that, you have to sort of work out, well, how, what proportion of the males do you have to make sterile? Um, you know, if you make 
you know, seventy percent of the males sterile. Is that enough, or do you need like a, you know, it only takes one male toad to power a lot of female toads, and then one female toad has like ten thousand offspring. So, you know, what proportion of male toads do you really have to make sterile before that works? So, how effective does your vaccine have to be? And so, we decided we would try and work out a way of testing this before they develop the vaccine. So you need, really need this sort of idea of how effective it has to be to know what you're testing the vaccine against. And so we had to work out a way of making um, cane toads that were male but sterile but still had their full libido, so still were keen and acted like males. Um, so we'd worked out there's a way you can actually do this in, and they do this commercially in both the salmon industry and in the oyster industry, and that's what they make something called triploids. So as your cells are dividing, you have to, to divide, you create haploids. So you've got two sets of chromosomes in your reproductive cells. They come down to one set of chromosomes. You get one set from mom, one set from dad. They come together to make a diploid offspring again. But you can do this weird thing that in the female side, the, the second it's called the second polar body, the second set of chromosomes gets thrown out just at fertilization. And if you shock it at just the right time, you can stop that being thrown out and you can actually collect all together. And you're going to end up having an organism that has three sets of chromosomes instead. So it's a triploid organism. Uh, if you do that, then when that organism, it grows up normally, just has three sets of chromosomes, but it's, it's perfectly normal. But when it goes to create its own gametes, it's really hard to divide three by two and get an even number. So it ends up having the, the gametes, so the sperm and the egg with an unset number of chromosomes, and then that doesn't work anymore. And so it becomes infertile. So this is a way of creating a sterile um, organism that is fully functional and still has all its libido. Um, the challenge there is that if you do that normally, you'll end up with 50% females and 50% males, and so you've got wasted half your effort on producing females that you didn't want. So, question is, how do you do that? Well, it turns out there's a um, there's a trick that if you were to get a female a, a male toad turn it into a functionally reproductive female toad, mate that with a normal male toad, and then make the offspring of that um, that um, a triploid that would end up with a hundred percent male offspring. It's kind of a bit tricky, and don't worry about. It. Just just trust me, that works. So there's this magical way of creating a hundred percent male sterile offspring from toads, and the secret to that is to get a male toad and turn it into a reproductively functional female toad. So not sort of like a transgender sort of operation, just in terms of secondary sexual characteristics, like making them look like a female. That actually had to be functionally female. Uh, and it turns out you can actually do this in um, in the bufo species, so that's the toad species, uh, because they have this residual organ in the male called a bitter's organ, and that um, organ, when you take the testy out, can actually develop into an ovary. And so we did a whole bunch of tests trying to make that work to try and create these 100% sterile male offspring. So that was my sort of introduction. I always thought you should, after that, you should choose your projects based on um, how interesting they would be in dinner party conversation. So you've got to sort of have the, the weirdest possible thing. Um, so after that, I decided to become a marine biologist because that was much more um, single at the time and um, you'd be much more attractive to women, I thought, if you were a marine biologist. Um, and so also meant you get to hang out at the beach a lot. Um, and so I was trying to reinvigorate my physics background at the time. And so what I was interested in then is to try and describe the shape. So if you go down the beach, you'll find these little limpets, that, like little Chinaman's hat sort of shape shell. Um, and the interesting thing about that is that shell shape has actually evolved about 14 times completely independently in the fossil record. So there's obviously something really important about that shell shape. And so if I thought that if I could uh, like mathematically describe that shell shape and understand what the environmental forcing factors were, I could actually um, describe the environment for that because you know, things evolved to meet environmental pressure and I would actually work out what was the most important thing in the environment to do that. So that was a PhD and that took me a little while. Um, ends up there's this really great little things that when the wave washes over, that particular shape makes, makes the shell rock forward. And as it rocks forward, the front of the shell actually hits on the substrate, so it hits on the rock and that produces friction, which stops the, wash, the shell getting washed off. Um, it turns out so that's a really good stability design. And if you look at things like race cars, and that kind of stuff, they actually start to evolve that design because they're more stable with crosswinds and a whole bunch of stuff. So it's lots of fun, but it turns out you know, um, these little shells have designed this long ago. Um, so that was evolutionary ecology, basically. That's the interaction of evolutionary biology and ecology and seeing how ecology actually drives evolutionary design. Uh, that got me more solidly back into my biophysics route. And so then I decided to become a full-blown biophysicist. My next project I actually worked on was um, looking at automated radio tracking systems for animals. 
So what we wanted to do is to be able to not just put a radio tag on something, but just have a computer be able to collect all the data and map them everywhere, wherever they went. Um, the hassle for that is the things we wanted to track were quite small and we there were no, so there was GPS tags at the time, but they were quite big and heavy. So you can't put like a GPS tag that weighs half a kilo on an organism that weighs, you know, like half a kilo itself. But there were these little things called pit tags, which just put out a little sort of radio beep. And so what we tried to do is say, well, what if I don't put the GPS on the animal? What if I put the GPS in a tower and have a collection of those and have them really accurately measured for time so that they could detect the time of arrival of that radio signal in each of the towers. And then from that time distance, the rival actually calculate the position of the animal. Um, to do that, you need time to be measured extremely accurately at those stations, but you also need to be able to receive the signal really clearly. Um, and, and it turns out that the, your, your spatial resolution is dependent on the frequency of that um, radio signal. Um, unfortunately, it's not dependent on the frequency of radio signals, it's dependent on the frequency of the message you put on the radio signal. And that's actually much lower than the frequency of the radio signal itself. And so we were trying to work out how we could measure, um, measure the time of arrival at that signal based on the frequency of the radio signal, not the radio signal message, which is a tricky thing to do. And so we invented a whole new way of doing, um, doing signal transmission, something we call phase delay keying. Um, which is uh, something we actually patented, became a whole new way of doing signal um, um, signal sending and digital stuff. It's, it's kind of complex, kind of didn't work in the far field, but you know, like you have new ideas that try and um, go somewhere and, and that was kind of fun. Um, at the same time as doing all that, um, I was becoming a commercial diver. So I went to a commercial diving course. We were doing um, my, my, one of my supervisors from my PhD was developing new diving techniques. And so we were um, just for fun getting dragged around the bottom um, behind a boat, trying to do new sampling techniques, which was kind of fun. Um, it's always good being strangled by your, your, your mask at the same time as you know, lots of things going on and trying to collect samples with your eyes closed. It's, it's kind of cool. Um, so at the end of all that, I ended up um, becoming an academic at the University of Newcastle. Uh, we were taught a range of subjects there. And I was an academic for a couple of years um, and then started getting into doing my own research. And my own research was quite interested in microalgae. So I started thinking about big world problems. So what are the big world problems? That's, you know, like how do you feed the world? How do you get energy? All those sort of things. And a lot of people were thinking that microalgae was a really great way of doing that. Microalgae these fantastic things that, you know, grow with sunlight, produce all these wonderful oils. They produce these fantastic proteins, all these specialist chemicals. They do all these wonderful things that are brilliant. Um, the only hassle with microalgae, and if you don't mention to people that, you know, it costs $10,000 a ton to make, they think it's a wonderful thing. It's very easy to sell. So the issue for microalgae is not, um, not can microalgae do interesting things. The interesting, the important thing about microalgae is can you grow it at a price which competes with you know, fossil fuels or food or anything like that. So it can actually enter into those markets. And it turns out that's a physics problem. It's a, it's a physics and a chemistry problem. It's not a biology problem. So I thought, well, that's, that's where I am. I'm a biophysicist. So I started designing what's called a photobioreactors. So this is a bioreactor that has a liquid phase. It's got an animal phase and it's also got a, um, a light phase. You have to work out how they all mix together so that the algae get just the right amount of gas and light and all those sort of things without spending too much energy mixing it and then not costing any money to build. And so we end up designing the world's lowest cost photobioreactor, which we ran up at um, the Fisheries Research Centre here at Port Stephens. Um, we patented that design. Uh, we had a, had a PhD student um, helping with some of the fluid dynamics inside of that, which was kind of fun. Um, so we had the cheapest machine going around, but we still couldn't make the numbers work. So we never ended up commercialising that. Um, but it was interesting and fun to do. Um, at that point, the, the company, I actually left the university and joined a company that was helping to commercialize that research and other, um, other clean tech stuff. So we end up doing high temperature thermal processing of biomass. So that's basically how do you turn a tree into something that you can squirt into your car. Um, so we were looking at different ways of doing how, how to do that, uh, particularly looking at a process called pyrolysis, which was kind of fun. Um, so pyrolysis is really basically making charcoal. And so when you do pyrolysis, you end up with a gas fraction, which is rich in carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And then you can turn that um, into uh, fuels by the Fischer-Tropsch process. And then you also have this um, basically carbon or charcoal left over. And it turns out 
charcoal, you can actually grind really, really well. So you can actually just grind it up in such a fine powder that when you mix it with liquid, it becomes a squirtable slurry fuel, which is kind of fun. So, the, so you can use that slurry fuel for big diesel engines and you can use the, um, the Fisher Trops fuel for, for smaller engines and you can sort of end up turning a tree into something you can squirt, which is um, a good way of thinking about how you do biofuels. Um, so that got me then thinking about uh, regional industry development. And so that's when I came back and joined the Tom uh, Farrell with Tim and had a lot of fun there um, trying to work out how not just um, basically, you know, the Hunter Valley has been successful because it has some areas of natural advantage. You know, it has you know, one of the world's premier coal resources in you know, with a nice port nearby and a good rail infrastructure in between and a world that wants to export coal. And so, you know, that's where we've been going. So basically the big economies of the Hunter has been export coal and, um, and export aluminium, which is really export coal. You know, it's just aluminium turning electricity, freeze it as aluminium and sell it off. Um, so, you know, we're successful there because we have an area of natural advantage. So we're trying to think, how do you actually build other areas of natural advantage in the Hunter Valley for other technologies? Because it's not obvious that because we're good at electricity from coal, we'll be good at anything else um, in the electricity field. And there was lots of pushes to say, well, you know, Hunter can be this you know, renewable energy superpower. And the answer is the question is, you know, why? Why? What's its area of natural advantage? You know, what, what would set the Hunter Valley aside from everything else? And so we got thinking about these ways of how you would sort of you know, build on and leverage the existing infrastructure to give you an area of natural advantage in the clean tech sector and how would you connect those two things together, uh, which we found was quite contrary to other thinking at the time, because at the time you know, people thought about the coal sector and the clean tech sector and they're two separate things and had to be kept separate. And as a politician, you had to be pro both, but you were never allowed to talk about putting regulation on either of them. Um, whereas the, really the sort of strategic model would be to actually try and leverage the coal sector to build your clean tech sector for you uh, and how, how would you build those incentives in. So there's a lot of sort of strategic thinking around that. Um, so that was moved into the world of being a sustainability futurist it, as part of all that electric vehicles were a really important part because electric vehicles are, um, are sort of like a transition. They, they make sense. Um, in fossil fuel world and they make sense out of fossil fuel world in clean tech worlds so they're a good transitional technology and in fact the hunter is actually a leader or was a leader in electric vehicle uh, manufacture but it was all the big things like trains and underground mining vehicles and um, you know, conveyors and all of those sorts of things so we actually had some areas of advantage there uh, unfortunately we frittered all of that away um, in the in the coal boom so there's some thinking there um, and after a while i then left the tom farrell institute and um, helped to found a digital marketing company because that's the obvious thing to do. Um, hang out <laughs> there for a, a couple of years um, and then moved into where I am now, uh, which is um, in a company called IC. So we sort of do the whole next generation of video collaboration tech. So um, kind of think about Zoom, but instead of you being here on a flat screen and seeing other people, that your video feed is now actually a participant in a 3D multiplayer game. And so you can run around the place and talk to people and interact with stuff all represented by a live video feed. So we do that, we sell that to education systems. So um, we sell that to you know, Queensland Education Department, New South Wales Education. So we're a startup, we're growing. And so I'm the head of business development for that particular company at this point in time. Um, so that's where I've sort of got up to now. Um, of course, we still have a like, anybody we've got those hidden passions hung away and we're thinking about what's the next thing and so i'm going to very quickly talk to you about what's the next thing um, so for me um, i like to ask different questions and so one of the questions would be what would our landscape look like if we could eat any plant so at the moment if you think about you know if you drive out in the hunter valley and you have a look at the landscape the landscape has been completely changed from natural and why is it changed from natural and the answer is well you can't eat trees you know so if you want to turn that landscape into food the first thing you do is either bulldoze the trees and grow something else that you can eat or you bulldoze the trees and grow something like a cow that you can eat so at the moment how we act, you know the limitations of our gut is actually what's shaping the landscape and so um so if we if we want to think about um, how we might run the landscape differently. One of those ways is to think about, well, how can I eat different things? So really what we're talking about is, we've talked about something like second gen biofuels before. So first generation biofuels is biofuel made from food. So that you get like starch and turn it into ethanol or you get oil and turn it into biodiesel. 
Then there's this idea of second gen biofuels where you get lignocellulosic biomass, that's basically you know, trees or forestry waste or, or crop residues. And you try and then break that down and turn that into a fuel. Well, one of the ways of doing that is to break that down and um, the lignocellulose is kind of like, you know, about 40, 50% cell, um, um, sorry, lignocellulose is about 40% cellulose. And that cellulose is really a polymer of sugar. And so you can actually get, break down that polymer of sugar into the monomers of sugar and then feed that to yeast and the yeast produce ethanol. They can also eat yeast. And so there's another way, pathway here about thinking about how we actually use all the tech developed in the second gen biofuels industry to actually have a different pathway to food. So this is basically how could you eat a tree? Because if you're going to eat a tree, then it's more effective for me to grow a tree. So if you want to repopulate the landscape with something that's more natural like a forest, you actually have to be able to eat different things to make that land still productive for food production. So what we're trying to do, think about then is how we actually take all of that um, technology from the second gen biofuel industry and then flip that to the second gen food industry. So we start with lignocellulosic feed stock, we degrade that into monomers and there's like three existing ways in the biofuel sector where you can do that. There's a thermochemical pathway, a chemical pathway, a biological pathway. You then have those monomers, those um, either, um, you know, things like, like um, glucose or other things. And then you can feed that to, um, uh, to single cell protein production. And then that single cell protein production, you can eat directly, or you can extract proteins from you hear about all this like lab grown meat and stuff. Well, that still needs proteins to grow with. It still needs all of those building blocks. Um, so this could be a feedstock into more desirable food items like either lab grown meat or things like um, eating directly or, or feedstocks, you know, like chicken feed or, or salmon feed or those kind of things, um, fish feed that actually have a much higher conversion ratio. Um, so if we can work out how to do that, then what we've done is effectively decouple what we eat from what we grow. And then that gives you complete freedom then to manage the landscape in a way which is much more uh, friendly to um, our ecology. Because uh, at the moment, you know, step one, you know, it doesn't matter if you're an org organic or a biodynamic um, food producer, the first thing you do is bulldoze all the trees to create space to grow the things that are edible. Um, so if you can actually eat those trees in the first place, that means you can keep those trees and keep growing them in the landscape and keep a landscape that's more natural. So that's the kind of stuff that I'm interested in now, which is a bit more fun. Um, and we'll see if I get onto that after my, um, after my current position. Let me, uh, how do I stop my sharing? There we go. Uh -huh. um, so happy to answer any questions that was a bit of a bit of a huge brain dump of the history of Gary so um <laughs> don't pull me all over you're a bit muted Tim yes I'm unmuted Gary thank you very much for that that was a run through from uh, a whole encyclopedia of <laughs> science really can I take you back to your origins though and ask you if in your in, in your travels have you had any mentors that you remember people who who pointed you on a particular path or the path to science um yeah so there would have been a couple so um uh so i had a, a teacher in primary school who was um my, like my mum was a pe teacher and then ended up being a, being a sort of like a uh, an assistant at the school and sort of helped to teach them science and stuff. But I had a headmaster who was a Russian guy who was obsessed with mathematics. And so um, he got me into mathematics, which was lots of fun and into computer programming when that was a, that was a very new thing. Um, and so that sort of got me started. And um, that was really helpful because it's sort of like, once you build a bit of success, then it's much easier to sort of stay successful in a way, like you, you get reinforced, you know, you do something, you get, you get sort of praised for doing something good, that you enjoy it more, and then you do it more and you get better at it and you sort of like snowball in the right direction. Um, so that was really helpful. Um, then when I went to go to um, university, it was actually my mum that said, maybe you should do biology. I really enjoyed biology and I had a sort of spare major, so I thought I'll give it a whirl. And um, that was that was really great. You know, that was fantastic. Because I'd actually grown up as a kid in a country farm running around, you know, like, you know, so um, you know, it's really good to have... Um, you, you find that kids have grown up on farms when you bring them out to the field, they sort of, you know, they just feel at home, they're natural, they're not sort of freaking out about everything. So that's really helpful to be able to just go and do stuff without worrying about things, um, which is, you know, so life experience is good on that front. 
So I really quite enjoyed that. Um, so my mum was a big influence there. My dad was an interesting one. Um, when I graduated from my PhD in biophysics, he said, you would have made a really good engineer. I oh, thanks, Dad. <laughs> That's really great timing. <laughs> so, <laughs> but of course, he was an engineer. So, you know, like that was him complimenting me because, you know, it, for him, everything was compared to engineers, basically. And so as a biophysicist, I was kind of like a biological engineer. So that you know, was really him just giving giving me his stamp of approval. It's kind of funny. Um, so, yes. Well, thank you, Gary. Uh, what I'll do is take the... Uh, position as chief of this event to say we won't have any more questions uh, until we get uh, through Matt because even though we started late we are halfway through our activity so what I'm going to do now is to move one step further and to uh, share my screen if I can remember how to do that, why can't I do that? Yes, I can. Um, because I want to introduce now um, Matt Haywood. And Matt Haywood might pop up here. Has he? No, dash. Uh, come on. No. Why won't it go? Why won't it go? What do you mean down arrow? On your, on your keyboard. Yeah. Oh, that one, that one. Well, ladies and gentlemen uh, in the audience, please, would you write any questions into the chat as we go? Our second speaker is Matt Hayward, and I've known Matt uh, just for a few short years, but in that time I've been absolutely amazed by his enthusiasm for, for science and his great, great uh, range of projects that he's working on and indeed I know that he's keen to take some students to India to see the tigers. I know he's done all sorts of things. One, one of the things he's done that I'm going to ask him about a question, a question about later on is he's worked with fossorial mammals and we'll get to those I think. But he started off uh, with a, with a uh, PhD in West Australia, then he went to South Africa, and then he went to Poland, and then he went to Wales, and he came back to Australia, and he went away again, he came back to Australia, and Newcastle is very, very lucky to, University of Newcastle, very, very lucky to have Matt Haywood as one of its staff members. He's truly had a science odyssey, and again, the purpose of the seminars is to learn about a scientist, but also to think about how that affects, how that relates to the development of your grandchildren and what you can do to say to them, science is a good career in all of its guises, even engineering. So there we are, ladies and gentlemen. It's much better to see Matt in the in the live than to see him on my slide. Over to Matt. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, and, and that science odyssey that you talk about is entirely attributed, attributable to my failures. And so today I'm gonna to talk about some of those failures and how lucky I've been because of those failures and how they've kind of reshaped my career. So you could be very confused to think that, well, I'm at the pinnacle of my career. Um, well, in the end of, 2020, I had to put in a big application, 30 pages of all my the highlights of my career and why I should be promoted. Um, I had to list uh, 12 people from around the world who I've never worked with and didn't know weren't related to me, um, eminent scientists who could vouch for me as though I was a, a scientist of international note. And then after I had an interview with 20 people sitting around a room interrogating me and um, being generally quite mean to me, I thought. And ultimately, they were kind enough to award me with a professorship. And so this is kind of the pinnacle of my career. Um, and, and, you know, although Tim has shown that you can move on and become emeritus professor, um, this is probably as far as uh, someone with a limited intellect like myself can go. And so um, I, I, but what I want to tell you now is this success that you might conceive is really a whole, is built upon a whole heap of failures, um, and which is often the way with, with um, success. And so I guess... I'll go through now a history of my failures and, and how they've shaped the, the career path that I've been able to take. 
So the first one was um, talking to my dad. So my dad's the guy sitting down on the left-hand side of that picture, and he was the um, the president of the Institute of Australians and Surveyor, uh, sorry, Institute of Surveyors of Australia um, for a while. And he had a surveying company, Lane and Haywood. And during the school holidays, I used to go and work for him as a surveyor's field hand and used to chop down trees and dig holes and you know, had a great time as a young kid. But he made it very clear early on that there was no future in surveying for me. He didn't think family businesses work. And so I should look elsewhere to find a career. And so that was quite confronting as a, as a you know, pretty young kid thinking, well, that doesn't want me to work with him. So I'll need to find some other kind of career. But it turns out it was a, a blessing in disguise. And so I, you know, I bumbled my way through uh, high school and playing sport and, and you know, not really knowing what I wanted to do beyond the fact that I was highly interested in animals. Um, so I put down, you know, when I was thinking about future um, careers, I put down a Bachelor of Science as, as one of my career options. Um, and then I, you know, I spoke to mum and dad about it and they said, well, you know, this, well, dad particularly said, there's no, it's, it's like you're doing an after degree. Why would you do a science degree? It's really general, maybe do something more specific. So I thought, all right, I'll do a physio degree or a Bachelor of Medicine up in Newcastle. Turns out, fortunately, I failed the HSC uh, enough not to get in, get marks to get into those top two courses. So I was forced to do a Bachelor of Science degree at the University of New South Wales. I was also madly passionate about cricket. And so I played cricket for 15 years at the University of New South Wales Cricket Club alongside Jeff Lawson, who's in the middle of that cricket photo. And um, Dan Christian came along at the end. I played my first game at the club with Michael Slater opening the batting at the other end. Um, so I had a fantastic time. But over that process, I kind of started to learn about science and then I just became more and more enthralled. And, and I think the reason I was brave enough to you know, continue on doing this broad science degree was because of my mum. And she's pictured down in the, the picture on the bottom left-hand side. And she's one of the knitting nanas there who now stand up and protest uh, quite regularly down at Milton and um, for a variety of environmental programs. So she, she's always been very supportive of um, my choices in life and, and she's probably my, my first great mentor along with my dad as well. So when I finished my undergraduate um, bachelor's degree I, I thought well I'd like to continue on and do a bit of research so I started chatting to different academics and the guy on the left-hand side is a guy called Barry Fox who now lives up in Dudley and he was a professor at the time at the University of New South Wales and I hit him up for a, to do an honours project. And he kind of looked at me and said, look, mate, you, you haven't done my course. Uh, my, what I do in honours is pretty hard. I don't think you'd be up to it. So, no, no, you can't do honours with me. So I failed again with him. So I headed down the whole corridors and there was this American guy uh, called Mike Orgy, who's pictured in the second from the left picture. And Mike uh, is a massively unusual fellow. Um, he wears his snakeskin boots marching up the corridors of the University of New South Wales, whistling um, God Save the Queen in his American Stetson hat um, and you know, offered me this, this honours project looking at um, uh, the response of ringtail possums to fire. And so I, I said, this is fantastic. I've always wanted to work on these things. I'd love to do that. And then I went back to him you know, six months later when I was ready to start and there was a massive fire that had gone through over the time and all the retail possums that he had called had died. So my options there had failed, so I had to move on to something else. And he was kind enough to say, well, what about looking at bat's teeth? And I had no real interest in bat's teeth, but it did mean I could go across to the US for a month and study with the lady on the right-hand side there, Patricia Freeman, who was an expert on micro bats, so the little um, echolocating bats. And the cross-sectional shape of micro bats teeth reflects their diet. And so we wondered whether the same thing happened in megabats, the flying foxes that we get pretty commonly around here. And so I went over to Trish Freeman's uh, lab and worked with her for a, a month. Uh, and also got to ski in Keystone and Breckridge on the way home um, where it had five foot of snow in five days. And so that was a fantastic experience for me. But you know that failure of getting in to work with Barry originally and then the Possum Project, they all dropped out. But then I ended up having an amazing experience learning about bats too with Trish Freeman in the end. So at the end of my honours study, uh, you know, Michael Orgy came back and um, said, oh, congratulations, you've got first class honours, well done. Do you want to do a PhD? I said, oh, wow, that'd be amazing. I'd love to. No one in my, my household has ever been to university, let alone do a PhD. That'd be fantastic. And, and we kind of looked at each other and I'm sure you all know the idiosyncrasies of um, academics. They're not socially aware, particularly 
very well. So um, Mike looked at me for a good 30 seconds and I looked back in a very awkward moment. And then I said, all right, then I'll see you and walked out the door, not knowing how I was supposed to do this PhD. So I went out and became a, an environmental scientist for a consultancy um, for a company called SMIC, a Snowy Mountains Engineering Corporation that built the Snowy um, system, hydro system many years ago. And within a month of land, starting to work with SMEC, I landed in Hyderabad in India um, and I had to drive around the, the main highways of um, Andhra Pradesh looking for the impact of the highway upgrade on tigers. And so I had this little 1967 Dart driving around in my driver, Babu. Babu, just before we started, um, did a bit of maintenance on the car and took off the windscreen wipers to make sure they were clean and forgot to put them back on. So as we're driving out the first day during the start of the monsoon, we both with our heads out the window um, saying, geez, I wish we had windscreen wipers on this car. Later on the next day when it was 40 degree heat, turns out Babu had taken off the drive, uh, drive uh, belt for the um, air conditioner. So we had no fans in the car either. So it was quite hot and sweaty uh, period with Babu. But after uh, three weeks driving around Andhra Pradesh, I started needing to go to the toilet quite frequently. And so we popped off to the hospital the doctor there showed me his, um, his certificates. He'd you know, learnt in the US, you know, now gone back to India to work. And he drew a picture of my torso and he palpitated my stomach and where I said, oh yeah, it hurts a bit there. He said, okay, that's great. And he drew a picture on my medical certificate. And then he said, there you go, you got dysentery. Um, off you go, Take, increase your, your um, malaria tablet dose and you should be fine. Sadly, I've never been the same, same since, but uh, I did have a wonderful time. After my time in India with the consultancy, I then moved on to a lot of environmental impact statements, looking at uh, the West City Dam project on the right-hand side there, and lots of studies on sewage treatment plant upgrades. Um, and after you know, having my lunch, looking at the inflows to sewage treatment plants for, for a couple of years, it got a bit wearing. And so Mike Orgy, my honours supervisor, rang me up in the middle of nowhere. I'd been seconded to um, go down, or to work for the RTA as their environmental officer down in Wagga Wagga. So I'd fly down on Monday morning, Fly back on Friday afternoon, and I was at this hotel, and, and I got a phone call, the first phone call I got, and Mike um, rang up to say, "Look, do you want to do that PhD we talked about four and a half years ago?" And I thought, "Well, okay, that's been a wait, but yes, I definitely do." So the next week, I flew across to Western Australia to meet Paul de Torres, who's the guy pictured there, and started working as part of his Operation Fox Dog project, which is a, about a half a million hectares in the southwest Jarrah Forest of WA, uh, in with different treatments of fox control, so controlling. Um, foxes at different intensities to see how the fauna responded. And one of the species they were targeting was the quokka. And so I studied the conservation ecology of the quokka for three years over in Western Australia. Um, people think it's the, the smiliest, happiest animal in the world, but I can assure you that the terrors, they bite, they urinate on you, they scratch you, horrendous animals. But the quokka was kind of decimated from the arrival of foxes back in the 1930s. Um, and the population has plummeted since then. But I got to go out and grow really cool beards and um, look tough in my macho outfits, um, chase animals out with radio collars on in, in the beautiful Jarrah Forest. So, you know, my, my fortune at um, you know, that uncomfortable chat with Mike Orgy um, during my honours and then, you know, finally came true and I was able to, to you know, do what I'd always dreamed of doing, I guess, um, from, a, from a biological position. But then after I finished my PhD, there was a job advertised at Sydney Uni. I thought, this is exactly where I want to go. I'd love to get into academia. It was 2003 and uh, 2002. And so I applied. I got an interview. I thought, here we go. This is great. But I didn't get the job. So I was heartbroken. Um, but it did kind of prompt me. I saw who the guy who got the job was. He's still at Sydney Uni and he's a very good scientist. But it kind of prompted me to, to think, right, well, this is what I have to do to get into academia. And that's where he is. So I need to work that hard extra hard to get into that kind of, um, level that he is. So it motivated me to an extent. So having failed to get that job at Sydney Uni, I saw an advert in um, a web page, the web just kicked off at that stage, um, to work on bushmeat hunting of the blue diker, particularly this is the smallest antelope in Africa shown on the right hand side there, um, in South Africa at the Walter Sisulu University in the Transkei of South Africa. And it meant I lived on the, the floor of this guy's house, Michael Summers, who's a Great friend. I, I lived on the maid, four of the maids' quarters at his house in, um, in Tart and spent uh, a wonderful six months there. Um, unfortunately, I, I never got paid there. So I then had to look for other options. And I went to a, a conference down in Cape Town, down here, and I met a guy called Graham Curley, who's up in the top right hand 
outside of the picture there. And he said, well, look, if you haven't been paid, why don't you sneak down here to the University of Port Elizabeth, which is around here. It's now become the Nelson Mandela University. We're about to reintroduce lions to the Addo Elephant National Park, and we'd love you to uh, come and join us. So I thought, well, I've you know, failed at this other project with dikers, but this sounds like a good opportunity to resurrect my career. I'm there. So I, I moved down a couple of months later down to um, Port Elizabeth and started chasing lions around. I didn't know anything about lions, but um, I, I thought I could read a lot and learn pretty quickly. And so, yeah, we went out and chased lions. At that stage, I also bumped into this New Zealand girl um, who I had moved into her chalet, her little like three metre by four metre hut. Um, and she didn't like it, obviously. So she had to move out for this new postdoc coming in. Um, but a couple of weeks later, she moved back in. She hasn't left my side since. But I got to go out and chase lions. Uh, and saw how the lions interacted with elephants and saw the lions eating kudu and warthog and buffalo and just yeah, had you know, a dream period for three years while we were living the life that we couldn't have imagined ever leaving, uh, living. But then Gina, my wife, got pregnant. She wasn't my wife at that stage. We were, it was a shotgun wedding. Um, but so my, my, I thought, my, here we go, my career's ruined, but I come back to uh, Australia or New Zealand to, to have these kids. Um, and I had this amazing life. I was out chasing animals all the time, you know, partying as much as I wanted. And all of a sudden I had these kids and couldn't go out partying. I had to have a much more constrained life. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, and I've since had a couple more and, and they're, they're all amazing. But when we were back in Australia, um, I was looking after our oldest daughter, Maddie, for three days a week and my wife went back to work uh, for those three days. And the other two days I was working as a surveyor's field hand again um, and labouring and having a pretty thoughtless but good fun life. And I also had an opportunity to apply for a job at the ACU at St. Catholic University in North Sydney. So I applied for that and once again, I failed. One of my friends got the job and so um, you know, I felt all right about it. But again, it gave me a benchmark of where I had to be in my career to be competitive for these kind of jobs. And so I started working harder. That failure meant I looked in web pages again for another kind of jobs. And I found one at a place called Bielowieża in the far east of the European Union, uh, far east of Poland. And at Bielowieża, they had this Mammal Research Institute led by uh, Bogusia and Wodek Jędrzejewski. And I'd read about their papers on wolves and lynx and these amazing animals for, for years. Um, during my PhD and, and subsequently. And so I just thought this would be an amazing experience. And so I became a Marie Curie European Union um, postdoc fellow over in the Mammal Research Institute for two years and made some great friends there. So Raphael Kowalczyk, who works on European bison, um, we, we did a couple of papers there. And, and it's just an amazing place, this Bill of Asia. So it's kind of what Europe used to be vegetated like up until it's all been cleared with um, human expansions. Come, you know, lots of wolves in there. Uh, European bison is the last place where they survived. They were down to seven individuals and there's now, they've been bred up, um, reintroduced around the world and there's now over uh, 4,000 like, around the world. There's beavers there, lynx, um, the highest diversity of fungi anywhere in Europe. Uh, just an amazing place to go. But after two years there, postdocs are always limited, so they're contract based. Um, I was offered a position to stay there, but I thought I'd want to go somewhere else. Um, and so I started applying for jobs. I got an uh, interview for a job at uh, Melbourne Zoo is the lead of, head of science there. I uh, failed out there as well. So instead, I was forced to take a job for the Australian Wildlife Conservancy as their regional ecologist. Uh, my job was to look after the sanctuaries in the southeast of Australia. So Kalamurna out near Lake Eyre, Dakalanta on the Eyre Peninsula, Buckaringa in the Flinders Ranges, Yukamara in the Mallee of South Australia, and Scotia in the Mallee of New South Wales. And it was just an amazing experience to learn kind of the practical side of conservation. And we I lived for a while out of Scotia on the border. This is the South Australian border running along the side here. Um, that's halfway between Broken Hill and Wentworth. So pretty arid conditions. But out there, there's a, an 8,000 hectare area surrounded by this two metre high fence with electric wires on the outside. And inside the fence, there's a huge number of species being reintroduced that nobody would really know about, I guess. So we've got the bridal nail wallaby up here, one of the prettiest wallabies um, to be found in, in Australia. Got the burrowing betong, Australia's only burrowing macropoded, a uh, wallaby. Um, they, when they fight, they lie down on their side and kick each other for some reason. I suppose their tails aren't strong enough to hold them on. Got the, the woily on the right hand side up the top there. Um, it's got a prehensile tail, it's also known as the, the um, rust tailed betong. 
and they collect nesting material in their tail and hop along and make nests under trees. Everyone knows the bilby, I'm sure. Uh, big ecosystem engineer turning over lots of soil. We've got the numbat, um, again, termite eating animal, and the greatest stick nest rat. So I got to work with all these animals and do lots of monitoring on them and, and understand how, what we have to do to manage um, the land to improve the conservation plight of a lot of these um, threatened species in Australia. I also got to go out to Lake Eyre and spend a lot of time out at, um, just north of uh, Lake Eyre, the Kalamurna Sanctuary. It's a 6,000 square kilometer area that links up the Lake Eyre National Park with the Simpson Desert Regional Reserve. Um, and it just has some amazing country. So you know, Sturt's Desert, Stony Desert, uh, with gibber birds and um, uh, gibber dragons out there, dune fields, uh, salt, salt plains, pans, lignum swamps with inland tire pans and grey grass rings. But I was also fortunate to be there at the end of the millennium drought. So we had these great sandstorms that came out during the surveys that we were doing, uh, where you couldn't see you know, much beyond the front of the vehicle. And then the next day it started raining and we had huge amounts of rain, completely you know, spreading out well beyond the, the Warburton Creek you can see in the middle here. So much so that ultimately we were able to drive boats down and take guests out, supporters of the Australian Wildlife Conservancy, out um, on the river, it was about six metres deep at that stage, um, and take them, you know, showing them the, the countryside out there during the height of the floods. After a while, I kind of moved, wanted to move on and I wanted to move into academia still. And so I think I had about 12 job interviews for the last year I was at AWC and um, failed every one of those didn't get any of them um, until I started applying overseas. And then ultimately in North Wales, they were kind enough to give me a job in academia. So I, I began my academic career. I lived on the side of the hill in the, the in, beside the Snowden National Park and um, worked beside this Hogwarts building um, at Bangor and, and just really had a fantastic time. I was lucky to be mentored by this lady, Julia Jones, who kind of showed me what academia was like and really directed my career and was just a fantastic host. So much so that when we were considering where to move over, she sent or got her kids to send over a photo book of what life was like in Wales so my kids could see what, what it was going to be like. And we sent them to one of the local schools where they were, uh, you know, were educated with Jules's kids. Um, and they, they learned all in Welsh. So one of the big things when you're in Wales, it's probably advisable to do as the locals. And so um, our kids learned Welsh for the first uh, four or five years of their um, academic careers and then since moving back to Australia they've also been educated in English. Um, but I had some great students too. I had um, Pete Haswell working on wolves, uh, Ludmilla Osipova working on elephants, Martin Hoffman working on peccaries, just um, some really great students that really facilitated my advancing my career. I also had a neighbour called Craig Shuttleworth who was mad on red squirrels and he eradicated grey squirrels. So grey squirrels are the cause of red squirrel decline throughout um, the UK, they were introduced in the 1700s by King Charles, and they just outcompete and spread disease to the red squirrels, the native red squirrels. And so Craig removed grey squirrels from the island of Anglesey, which is just down here uh, on the map, and then reintroduced red squirrels. And so you can see now um, the red squirrels are still persisting there. But what he was concerned about was how to stop red squirrels moving from Anglesey here back onto the mainland, because the Menai Strait was really narrow. Now, this is Craig here. And he came up with the idea there had been some research in Northern Ireland showing that pine martin um, lead to red squirrels increasing and grey squirrels decreasing. We're not really sure of the mechanism, but it seemed to be a good relationship for us to use. So we reintroduced uh, pine martin along the Bangor coast of the mainland uh, in the hope that they're going to stop grey squirrels from reinvading into this area. And so far, the pine martin have done pretty well. We haven't seen too many grey squirrels. But then um, Boris Johnson got onto his, um, his Brexit uh, vote and they won Brexit and Donald Trump was elected. So we thought, oh, it's easy to deal with racists back in Australia. Um, so let's try to get back home. So we applied for a job back in uh, Australia and we're lucky enough to get it at the University of Newcastle. And we've now, uh, I've met Tim there. He's taken me to Borneo, he's shown me proboscis monkeys. I've got a great set of colleagues and a great set of um, students and so yeah i've really been able to um yeah get where i wanted to go in a career purely because of the failures that i've had along the way you know i think i look back and i think i could be working with dad's company and i would have been a really bad surveyor 
Um, I could still be an environmental consultant and I probably wouldn't have done a very good job at that. Could be a, essentially a teacher at the Australian Catholic Uni because they don't get to do a lot of research. And again, I wouldn't have been very good at that in the longer term. AWC would have, would have been good, but you know, I really did want to get into academia and, and do kind of novel research and have you know, pass on what I've learned to, to other students. So there's a whole range of things I wouldn't, would have missed had I not um, failed at things. So I guess I look back on my failures as a way of opening up opportunities. Certainly it made me work harder, it helped me identify you know, what level I have to be at to be competitive for some of these jobs, but it also makes me appreciate my successes a lot more and um, has opened up a whole new world for me had I not failed. So um, I realise for lots of people, failure can be really heartbreaking, but I think when you get past that initial failure, you can also open up lots of doors and avenues for you. So embrace your failure in the longer term. Thanks very much. Muted, Tim. Good. I've unmuted. There we are. Gee, I'm good at this. So, Matt, that, that was fascinating. Thank you ever so. And Gary, thank you ever so as well. Um, I would like to have everybody think of what questions they might like to ask. We've got um, some, some time to do this uh, and I'll take the prerogative of the first question, Matt. Um, what is a fossorial animal and what did you do to them? <clears throat> fossorial animals are animals that dig in the soil and so when I worked for the Australian Wildlife Conservancy, we reintroduced lots of fossorial animals, things like bilbies, um, woylies, booties. They turn over a huge amount of soil. In fact, I think someone has done the research to work out that a booty can smell, a, oh, sorry, a woylie can smell a grain of rice under about 50 centimetres of soil and dig down and pick it up because they, they feed on um, mycorrhizal fungi, fungi that live under the ground. And so this process of turning over the soil turns out to be really valuable for the soils that have in that arid part of Australia. So really bad conditioned soils have um, you know, nothing to hold them together. So as soon as the wind picks up, the soils are blown away and our biggest exports probably soil to New Zealand. Um, but also when it rains, the rain just washes away and, and you know, they lose that local rainfall. A better conditioned soil, you start to get a cryptogamic crust, which is a lichen, and a moss kind of holding the soil together. So it doesn't blow away so much, but it's still, um, you know, the, the water doesn't soak in as well. When you get all these pits from the digging that all these fossorial animals do, the water soaks in, they become little microclimates. So whenever seeds drop in, they become, they land in a little moister environment, a bit cool, a bit shaded. And so, uh, and the, tur the um, turbulence from winds blowing over, it doesn't mean the soil's all washed away. So these become little germination hotspots and you get lots of plants growing up in that environment. So they're really important ecosystems. Well, thank you. Thank you for a fossorial animal. So. My second question to you is, what is your favorite animal of all these animals you've worked on? I used to think cheetahs were my favorite animal because they're the fastest predator ever to have lived around. Um, but having lived with lions for three years um, and just saw the life they lead, I think a lion's a pretty good, good animal to, to watch and to live. And it was, we were very lucky. We, you know, we lived with these animals for three years. So we, we knew exactly who was fighting with who and you know they lions lie around for 22 hours a day but it's not as if they sleep for that time and there's always a battle going on and some kind of competition happening so it was fascinating to watch you know the females fighting against each other when they're trying to raise their cubs or you know, the dominant male pair trying to well the, the subordinate male pair trying to take dominance from the, the currently dominant male pair and you know, we watched all the, the interactions between these lions um and so yeah i just fell in love with I believe there have been some lion cubs named after you lot, is that so? That is true. We, we were there, um, the lionesses, the, the, the knowledge that South African National Parks have of the ecology of the species um, meant that they didn't want to rapidly increase the population size. So they reintroduced four males and two females at the same time because they thought that in two different groups. So they thought the two groups would fight and then slow the females from breeding down. Uh, and that did happen. And so ultimately it was about the middle of the second year that we're out there when they started, the females were giving birth and successfully. Um, and we saw another female go in and kill the cubs of this, the female that had bred. And so we were pretty heartbroken at that. But then finally the, the murderous female 
um, gave birth and the park staff were kind enough to name the cubs after my, my wife and myself. So um, yeah, they those young cubs have since grown up many years ago and they've moved on now to other national parks, to found populations in other national parks in the Eastern Cape. Um, so yeah, it was a great honor. Excellent. So um, I'm looking now for other questions. I don't have questions in the in the uh, in the chat box. I don't think. Do Can I? I ask one of Gary then while we wait? Yeah, sure. Gary, what what is the feasibility of getting um, using kind of trees and cellular lignin and things like that to become food sources for us? Well, uh, this is why this is how you know it's a research project, yeah, because we don't know the answer to that yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> so like, so if you're thinking about a business, you know, launching a business into something, you've got to sort of understand whether are you talking about scientific risk or are you talking about engineering risk. So, your know, scientific risk is sort of understanding which you know are you in the performance box. You know, do you have the the right yield and all those kind of things that you need. Uh, and then the end, and this sort of like engineering scale up, which is working out how you, you know, how you build it and how you make it more efficient, all those kind of things. And so this is still solidly in the um, in the innovation space around the, the science end. Now we have a series of technologies we can connect together to get it done, um, but trying to work out how to do that in a way that. So if you, if you think about um, at the moment, if you want it to be economically viable, you know. Uh, a farmer basically, you know, is going to put a cow on, you know, if you've got a, a bit of land with some sunshine and some rain and a slope more than 10 degrees or something, you're going to put a cow on it. And if you put a cow on it, you know, really what you're doing is selling biomass at a bit less than 100 bucks a ton, because that's sort of obvious. Look at how much a cow eats, how much you get a cow to that. So, um, so you need to sort of be able to look at a conversion efficiency to a food product. Now you're going to sell a food product at like, you know, 1200 bucks a ton if it's a thing and you know, work back to work out, okay, what's my conversion efficiency so I can end up paying at least hundred bucks a ton for, um, for lignocellulosic biomass. And if you can do that, then you can outcompete, you know, livestock grazing, which is the major land use in Australia. So uh, sort of trying to understand how you connect those dots together in the efficient way. So there's about four different pathways that, we know will technically work at the moment, um, trying to work out which ones are the right economically feasible pathways um, are still a, little, still a little bit out there, how you connect them together. It's mainly how you get the sort of yield as you connect the processes together um, is the difficult one. So I think I've spectacularly avoided the answer to your question there by saying, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, is, this is how you know it's a research problem at the moment, not, a, uh, not an engineering problem. And so, there's always been you know, so I've, I spent some of my life in the um, in the business game and some of my life in the science game and the biggest danger you have is where you try and make a business out of something that have scientific risk because you know you're never gonna you never know when you're going to get the answer to it in the science game yeah. um, and so you know you expose yourself to an enormous amount of risk if you try and push ahead with something where there's still science risk and that's why and that's why universities are such important places you know because you've got the time to keep ticking things over until the science rules get solved and then then it's you know off you go after that um, so yeah. perhaps a question for both of you um, as scientists i've always been absolutely intrigued by serendipity in life and also serendipity in science and many many stories that you read about uh, the discovery was made when when really uh, something went wrong or you were looking the other way and you saw the world differently and i i was just reading yesterday about a chemist um in australia who was uh, doing research on a particular activity and uh, they'd made a catalyst a a um, some sort of ceramic i think uh, composition to do to solve a particular problem, but uh, just by chance, they decided to see if they could make ammonia out of uh, nitrogen in the air and uh, hydrogen. And um, they managed to make ammonia uh, on this catalyst. Uh, and the way I read it, it was totally unexpected that they would find this revolutionary way of of uh, making ammonia. So 
you too. Uh, any thoughts on serendipity in science? Uh, how things happen and how clever we are as scientists or really not clever we are? Yeah, I've got an answer to that. Um, I, uh, when I went to South Africa, obviously I didn't know anything about lions. And one of the first questions the park manager asked me was, what are they going to eat? And, and I thought, well, I'm sure they'll eat whatever they ate from where they came from. And he kind of looked at me and he said, no, nah, no, nah, they come from the Kalahari Desert. Like, that's a completely different environment. Nothing like what's here. And in fact, none of the prey species are common between the two areas. So I thought, oh, God, no one. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe there's some common feature that, of predation that um, lions exhibit all throughout their range. And so, you know, I went off and did a bit of research on what lions um, prefer to feed on. So I you know, did a few stats to work out what it was. And, and I found 54 studies of what lions eat and what food was available. And so I was able to kind of do the stats to work out what species they prefer. And it turns out they prefer to prey on five different species, um, wildebeest, zebra, buffalo, um, Hemsbok, and one, a giraffe. Um, and they've got a weight range they prefer to feed on. So about between 190 to 550 kilograms, any species within that weight range, they're likely to kill. And so from there, we're able to predict the diet of the lions in Addo um, and, um, and then predict the number of lions that Addo can sustain. So this kind of simple question that Lucia's asked me, the park manager asked me, led on to this whole big field of research that I had no idea that even well, was possible. Um, but, but beyond that, again, it led on to serendipitous outcomes because I, I since expanded that. I thought, you know, this is a pretty good method. So I've done it to that kind of research for all the other large predators, including tigers. And so in 2019, I got a, an email from um, Yadvendradev Jala, uh, who was the senior scientist at the Wildlife Institute of India. And they were doing a population estimate of tigers throughout the country. And he asked me to come over and review their methods of the, the National Tiger Census. Um, and then began talking about uh, collaborations. The reason he got in touch with me because he wanted to work out whether the same kind of relationships between the number of tigers present at the site and the number of their preferred prey species. Um, he wondered if we could do that kind of research. And so, yeah, I've since yeah, got to know Jala and his family um, and, and have been over to India three or four times in the last couple of years, purely because of this serendipitous question that, that Lucia's asked um, about what the lions were going to eat. And it's a great avenue of research for me. And I love Thank it. you. I'm looking at Gary now. All right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So I, I would. I think um, zero and a bit of some stuff that Matt talked about. That really, you know, we sit inside this world of evidence. You know, where there's evidence everywhere. There's not a not a lack of evidence. The issue is the question which makes the um, evidence relevant, and then you can sort of yeah. So it's the question that helps you see the world. Um, and so one of the great things you get to do as a scientist is, is sit around and really think about questions that people don't know the answer to yet. Um, and, it, and that's the kind of, it's the question that helps you view the world in a fundamentally different way. So often as scientists, we sit around, well, people think as scientists, we sit around collecting evidence and we do, but really the important work we do is thinking of the right question to make the, the evidence relevant in a way. And, and it's and the insightful scientist is the one who can actually think of the intriguing question that no one thought to ask which sort of bifurcates the world and lets you view it in a new way um, yeah, I, I can I just jump in there Gary I reckon that that creativity of science is something that's really ignored like people think science has to be really smart that's about it but it's there's a massive creative side to be able to identify what those questions are and how you can solve some of those problems that is kind of um, missed a lot definitely yeah I always talk about science as a boxer you know you've got you've got two hands you go like you know is it this let me test is it this let me test it you know so you, you've got a you know we with, if you're only doing testing, you know you like you like a one-hour boxer. Yeah, you know mm. to be a to be a sci a good scientist, you have to be a fundamentally creative human being who likes to think of think of the world in ways that nobody thought of before. Mm. Um, you know, because because when I mean, often as you know, science can mean lots of things to lots of people. So science for some is entertainment. Science for some is a list of facts. Science for some is you know like some sort of religion. But for researchers at the edge of science, you know. Um, the science is something else altogether. Science is a completely creative discipline where you're, you're trying to think of fundamentally new explanations for how the world is put together. And then you're actually interested in your right. So you, you, you think of an explanation and the first thing you want to do is break it. You know, you want to test it to make sure it's not working because then you can think of something else, which is more exciting, you know. So, um, so yeah, I always think of science as a boxer. Create, destroy, create, destroy. <laughs> I'd, <clears throat> thank you for that. I'd just like to come in and reflect 
back on one of our presentations, Emily was talking about the flow hive that was invented up near Byron Bay by a, a, an individual who was a beekeeper who just was very interested in, is there a better way for getting honey from a beehive? And uh, he patented an invention and then looked for $70,000 to, to build the invention, which was a hive that you could just flick a switch on and the honey would flow out the bottom without you having to do everything that uh, beekeepers had been doing since 1865 when the original the beehive that you see now, the box beehive, was invented way, way back in 1865 and has been used ever since. And this guy just uh, was looking to think, well, is there another way? And he invented the flow hive within two minutes on the, uh, the funding platform where he was asking people in the world to give him money for the invention. Within two minutes, they had $70,000. And by the end of the campaign, which I think only ran for a week or perhaps a little longer, $12 million in sales had been pledged from all around the world uh, for this invention. And the flow hive has now uh, taken a, back, a place in the backyards of honey, of beekeepers all over the world. And there again, uh, exactly as, as Gary and Matt were saying, a, an individual thought of a different way to skin the cat, as it were, uh, to get the honey out without having to do anything, to upset the bees. The bees could still be flying in and out of the hive at the front. At the same time, you've turned the tap at the back and the honey is flowing out. So it's, um, yes, this is to me also what, we're meaning in a very broad sense about getting people interested in science, interested in, in new things and being able to take uh, an active part in the world. I'm sorry, Matt. Tim, what about a question for you? Um, what led you to, to come up with the idea for your Innovate Hemorrhoid Program? Yeah, well, that was just... Uh, uh, we'd, we'd found that uh, people with chronic conditions, chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia and rheumatoid arthritis, when we were, we, were, we were looking for an external cause, we thought there's some external cause of uh, these conditions. And we still believe that uh, it's underlying infection, but we couldn't, we couldn't measure that when we started uh, 30 years ago. But we could show that there was an abnormality in the amino acids in their urine. And so we started to talk to dear Ross Shamley, a compounding pharmacist who would make up amino acid mixes for these people. And, and uh, they had a very good effect on their symptoms. Uh, unfortunately, I think it is like just putting more petrol into the tank, even though there's a hole in the petrol tank, so that uh, it's topping them up and getting them going a bit more. Um, and so that was, that was one part of it. And the other part of it was some really interesting work that Hugh started on sweat and showing that in sweat, um, these important amino acids are lost when you lose your, when you sweat both in animals and in humans. And, and so it went to uh, the possibility of, yes, we could patent that. The university thought it was a good thing. Uh, the money went in and so give it a go. And at, as you move through life, you try all sorts of different things. And, and currently it's to get Innovate going is, is, my, is my goal. But many, many ideas have been, we, we did some research way back, um, which showed that if you looked at the white blood cells of 
of mice, uh, immediately after the mice had mated, there was a difference in the white blood cells. So that we were thinking the immune system has a way of recognizing that uh, copulation and mating has occurred and recognizing something. Um, and so we could, uh, we could detect virgins from non-virgins. And that was also a very interesting uh, amount of research that uh, unfortunately we weren't really able to follow through because of funding problems. But um, all sorts of interesting things pop up when you're, when you're doing science for sure. Are there any questions from the audience? Because I'm getting close to saying uh, we're at the end of this meeting. Any questions, please, if you've got a question. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering after the mating, was that for both males and females or just for the females? Just for the female. Yeah. Just for the female. What's that? Would have been more uh, useful in the medieval times. Uh, <laughs> now, 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 now. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, the final slide is on the screen. We are recording this particular uh, wonderful, wonderful set of presentations from Gary and, and Matt, and we will put it on the Hunter Innovation and Science Hub website. I'd like to acknowledge that uh, the New South Wales sorry, the uh, Australian government through Inspiring Australia has uh, assid assisted us in getting this um, to air. And I'd like to thank very, very much Gary and Matt for their, their time tonight. It's been a stimulating and wonderful show. And I thank the audience for coming along this second time. And I'd like to thank the organizer, Tim Roberts, for tirelessly supporting the sciences and the environment around the Hunter uh, and beyond. So thank you, Tim, for organizing this. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, thank you, Tim. And with that, I shall, there's Michael. Thank you, speaking. Gary and Matt. That was great. Yeah, well, it was very interesting. Fascinating. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> thank you. Toby? Hopefully it's not over yet, Matt. Hopefully yeah, you've still got some I more stories it. to make, yeah? <laughs> I enjoyed it. Well, thank you to the audience for coming. I believe my mum didn't show up. Well, you'll have to talk to your mum, won't you? And I'm going to say <laughs> goodbye. Thank you very okay. much. Bye-bye.